Hi, this is Dr. Michelle Robin with Small Changes, Big Shifts, Building Rhythm and Resilience. And I believe if you'll change one thing a month, one thing for the next 12 months, you'll change your life forever. Thanks for joining me on the journey. Well, welcome back for Small Changes, Big Shifts. We had an earlier edition today with my friends from Advent Health and Live and Vitality. Hopefully you have a chance to catch that show. Well, this evening, I am joined by Robbie Barbero. He's there. He's a co-founder of Mastering Diabetes, a coaching program that teaches people how to reverse insulin resistance via low-fat, plant-based, whole food nutrition. And you will notice right behind him, he's got lots of yummy food. I kind of want to get in there and have a little bit of that food you have back there. So I'm excited to hear about your gardening. Robbie was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 2002 and has an undergraduate degree from Stanford University and a PhD in nutritional biochemistry from USC Berkeley. Robbie, thanks for joining me today on Small Changes, Big Shifts. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I wish I could share some of the produce with you. I do want everybody to know that I'm not the PhD of, of this uh, enterprise here. That's Cyrus. Um, and um, we're, uh, we're a, a fun team here. But just oh, so I don't yeah, want people to understand. That's okay. But let's, um, let's redo it. So Robbie no. was diagnosed in type 1 diabetes in 2000 and has been living at a plant-based lifestyle since 2006. He worked at Forks Over Nice for six years and earned a master's in public health in 2019. How about that, Robbie? There you go. I just want, I just want people to be confused. <laughs> but um, I am so happy to be here and um, be talking about our, our book and, and the information that is, is changing a lot of people's lives. So it's just fun. So tell me about your story. Obviously, you're a young man of being diagnosed in the year of 2000, which is 20 years ago. That's right. With- Type 1 diabetes. And for our audience, why don't you, before you do that, explain the difference between type 1, type 2, and type 3 diabetes? Absolutely. So in uh, this country, we have over 120 million people are impacted by diabetes. The vast majority of them are living with either pre-diabetes or type 2. So over 85 million people in the United States alone are living with pre-diabetes and don't know it. There's another 30 plus million people who are living with diagnosed diabetes. And of all the diabetes out there, approximately 5% are living with type 1. So this is a version of diabetes where the beta cells in your pancreas have been destroyed. You're no longer producing sufficient quantities of insulin, and you have to inject insulin to manage your blood glucose levels. Now, pre-diabetes and type 2 they can potentially develop to a place where you need insulin to manage your blood glucose, but they are not required in the initial you know, onset of those conditions. Now, the, the condition of type 1 diabetes and also type 1.5 diabetes, this is it's classified as an autoimmune condition, okay? And that is where when you're living with type 1.5, you have a slow onset of type 1. It happens in older adults, and you're still producing a little bit of insulin but not enough to keep your blood glucose under control. And whereas initially pre-diabetes and type two, you're producing excess insulin, too much insulin. And the connection between all of them is insulin resistance. And that's what we do at Mastering Diabetes. We teach people how to reverse insulin resistance. That's the underlying cause of all blood glucose fluctuation. And so people who are you know, living with type one, type 1.5, it's really challenging to manage their blood glucose, they're struggling with weight gain, struggling with lack of energy, struggling with blood glucose control, brain fog. Insulin resistance is at the core of that. And when it comes to pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance is literally the cause. That is the cause of those conditions. And when you reverse it, you can absolutely reverse the disease process. You can eliminate medications for pre-diabetes and type 2. And for those living with type 1, type 1.5, our goal is to use the appropriate amount of insulin, okay? Insulin is not your enemy. It's a big thing we talk about in our book. A lot of people are scared of insulin. It's about using the appropriate amount when your beta cells are damaged. Does that make sense? That does make sense to me. So do you do any study with type 3 diabetes? Have you started studying that I mean, yet? Referring to Alzheimer's in that case? Yeah. Yeah. So there's no question that insulin resistance, again, is at the root of this. And it's, you know, you're, they're calling it type 3 diabetes. It's basically insulin resistance of your brain. Um, and that's, you know, Alzheimer's. And the, 
key teaching point here, again, for what we're doing is that when you're living with insulin resistance, you are putting yourself at risk for a laundry list of chronic conditions, including Alzheimer's. So that's going to be heart disease, cancer, fatty liver disease, chronic kidney disease. PCOS has an insulin resistance component, um, erectile dysfunction. Like the list is long. And so Alzheimer's is just one of them. And that is why you want to learn what you can do to maximize your insulin sensitivity and become more glucose tolerant. Tell me why, what conditions does insulin resistance not impact? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> I like that question. I mean, at the top of my head, I would, I mean, I would think, I mean, when it comes to chronic disease, I don't know. I mean, it probably is impact part of all of them. I mean, you could say, I mean, you could find like miscellaneous symptoms, like, oh, somebody has a headache or something. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to blame insulin resistance for that, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's at the core of, of just like gut health, you know, that's a major topic today, but oh, gut health relates to everything. You could, you could make a same argument for insulin resistance. And when you're doing the things that improve gut health, you're also improving your insulin sensitivity at the same time. What are the symptoms? So that we've got some people dialing in and listening today. What would you say? What are some of the symptoms of insulin resistance? Okay. So right now, um, if you're not diagnosed with diabetes, you're just, you know, the everyday person out there and you are struggling to with weight loss, that's a good indication you probably have insulin resistance. Okay. If you have struggles with mental clarity, with brain fog, good chance insulin resistance is a part of your life right now and it's time to fix that. Um, low energy is, is, is symptomatic that's issue there. Um, you know, again, insulin resistance is going to lead to elevated blood glucose levels in a lot of cases. So if you're thirsty, if you're struggling with that, um, that could be a part problem. Um, I would say those are the key ones. So brain fog, trouble losing weight, um, urinating more excessively, low energy levels, thirsty a lot, low energy levels. What about sleep? This, this, um, trouble sleeping could, is that insulin resistance? I think that could be connected. That could be connected. But again, I mean, you know, there's a kind of like the headache. I mean, there's a lot you could be stressed in your life and the stress could, could potentially cause insulin resistance lead to that. But, um, it, the, really the question is, are you living a lifestyle that is causing insulin resistance in, in, in the, in the, it's because insulin resistance is a scale. Okay. You have to understand that. Like, like what, what things can you do that really, truly, truly make you insulin resistant? And then, and again, the whole premise of our platform, what we wrote about in our book, Mastering Diabetes is about understanding that number one, there's nothing that is going to be a bigger impact, have a bigger impact on you becoming more insulin resistant than number one, trans fat, number two, saturated fat, and then an excess amount of unsaturated fat. So we have published, we wrote about research in this book here. We wrote about research how the replacing saturated fat with unsaturated fatty acids will make you more insulin sensitive. That's for sure. So you got to get out the trans fat. You got to limit the saturated fat. But how much of the avocados, the nuts and seeds, the coconut meat that you're having is also going to impact your insulin sensitivity. We'll talk about fats. Dive into that since you've got this master's in public health and worked for Forks Over Knives for six years. Six years. Why don't you dive into for our audience to understand the different fats? Okay, so I want to actually pull up an illustration in our book here, which I think is really powerful in, in helping our viewers on the live understand something. Okay, so this is page. Uh, we're on page one sixty-seven of the Mastering Diabetes book here, and okay. at the top. This is an illustration of a full day's worth of eating. Okay, so there's an apple, there's a banana. And for breakfast, you have the tropical fruit salad. For lunch, curried red lentils over fluffy quinoa. And for dinner, these are greens and beans. So the rest, the book has 30 recipes, two 21 day meal plans. And the point is, this a full day of eating includes five pounds, six ounces of food. So one of the key teaching points we have is that when you follow the Mastering Diabetes Method, you get to eat more and weigh less. That's a, that's a large portion of food. People eat about three to five pounds of food. So you could be following our method and, and almost double your food intake while actually still losing weight. That's because of the calorie density of the food 
and the water and the fiber and the nutrient density. So here's the point here. This entire day of eating, in, and this includes the tropical fruit salad, includes ground chia seeds, which we have as an insurance policy for your essential fatty acid requirements in the Master Diabetes Method. So every breakfast recipe, we're suggesting that you include either ground chia seeds or ground flax seeds, one tablespoon, and you meet your essential fatty acid requirements, write that in there. Um, so the point is, this entire day has 15 grams of fat, the entire day, okay? Now, on the bottom of this page, you see nine different foods, and each one contains 15 grams of fat. So one tablespoon of olive oil contains 15 grams of fat. One less than an ounce, 0 0.9 ounces of sesame seeds, 15 grams of fat. Peanut butter, 1.8 tablespoons, 15 grams of fat. Almonds, 1.1 ounces, 15 grams of fat. Coconut meat, 1.6 ounces, 15 grams of fat. So think about this volume of food that you can eat, meet your essential fatty acid requirements, and also this highlights that your fact that you're getting fat by eating whole foods, okay? That's, that's the take home message, honestly, okay? From this entire thing, is that people, people are consuming far more fat then they understand that they're consuming. And it's impacting their insulin resistance. It's impacting their blood glucose control. It's impacting their ability to lose weight. And when you become aware of what foods are high in fat, what foods are low in fat, you become the master of, of your, your body. And you can meet your essential fatty acid requirements. You can meet your micronutrient requirements, your need for protein, your need for carbohydrate energy. You can, your need for fiber. You can meet that when you follow the master diabetes method and limit your total fat intake to an appropriate amount. And as a, again, as a person living with type one diabetes, what got Cyrus and I into this, what got us so passionate about it was our initial experience, which then led us to the research. But I'm living with type 1 diabetes. Anybody living with any form of insulin-dependent diabetes, we are the best test subjects on the entire planet for insulin sensitivity. We know exactly how much insulin we're injecting. We're counting our carbohydrate energy to know how much insulin to inject. And we're monitoring our blood glucose levels all day long. Many of us now wearing continuous glucose monitors where we see blood glucose data every five minutes. We see the, the rise and the fall after every meal. We see exactly what's happening overnight. And we can collect these three data points. And we can answer the question, how efficiently is insulin taking glucose out of our bloodstream and into our cells? And so when I was doing a plant-based ketogenic diet compared to what I'm doing now, my insulin sensitivity changed by 900%. So when I did a plant-based ketogenic diet, I was eating lots of greens, lots of celery, but then my calories were coming from nuts and avocados and high-fat plant-based foods. And then now I'm eating a low-fat plant-based whole food diet where I'm eating lots of the fruits you see behind me, lots of greens, lots of non-starchy vegetables, herbs and spices, mushrooms. I'm eating these foods in abundance. I'm eating well over 700 grams of carbohydrate per day, and I'm using a physiologically normal amount of insulin, about 27 units of insulin per day total. That's including basal and bolus. So if you calculate, you know, the carbohydrate content on the, on the plant-based ketogenic diet, which again, on the plant-based keto diet, I was having like 70 grams of total carbohydrate, but then we're talking 30 of the net carbohydrate. So however you spin it, so you, the way you look at it is, you know, you take the total carbohydrate, you divide that by total insulin use, you can come up with a 24-hour carbohydrate to insulin ratio. And mine improved by, by 900% when I changed my diet. So that's just my story though. We have worked with over you know, thousands and thousands of, of clients come through the Mastering Diabetes Method, come through our coaching program, and we see this repeatedly. And we work with a lot of people living with insulin-dependent diabetes. And anybody who is like, oh, they're curious, I wanna try this, the insulin-dependent crew can see that feedback immediately. Oh, wow, I'm eating more carbohydrate, I'm eating less insulin. Wow, this is really cool. And my blood glucose is easier to control because I'm eating all this fiber. I'm getting all these micronutrients. And that's really fun. 
And so people living with type two diabetes, it takes, you see the results pretty quickly. Um, but as far as the, the medication drop and then the reduction in blood glucose, that, that takes, you know, a little bit longer and, but type ones, you see it in days. Wow. So, so you were talking a lot about, um, you know, we talked about the symptoms of insulin resistance. We talked about the 120 million people that suffer from a, uh, a blood sugar insulin resistance diagnosis, undiagnosed. What, what should people ask their doctor about if they're feeling these symptoms to kind of get to know whether they have pre-diabetic or type two or type one? What should okay, they so, talk about? Yeah, so if, if you are thinking, hey, you know what? I might have pre-diabetes. I think it's smart to ask your doctor for an A1C test. But if your A1C is 5.7 to 6.4, anywhere in that range, you're 5.7, you're living with prediabetes. You're 6.4, you're living with prediabetes. Anywhere in that range. Once you hit 6.5 and above, you've now gone into the type 2 diabetes category. 5.6 and below, that's non-diabetic. So get your A1C tested. That's the best piece of information you can ask your doctor for. You could also start testing your fasting blood glucose. You could get into that game. But honestly, getting an A1C is the best thing you can do. No. Oh, okay. Now talk a little bit. You know, there's this whole thing on plant-based diet, plant-strong. Is there a difference between plant-strong, plant-based? Okay. So there's a lot of different teachers and experts in the plant-based space. And, and the plant-strong approach, that's from our good friend Rip Esselstyn. And he created the Engine 2 Diet. And he sort of has trademarked Plant Strong, which is a diet that we absolutely support. It's great. And there's a lot of other variations out there. But I mean, what I will speak to is the specific method that we've created at Mastering Diabetes and, and why we've done that. So we have green light foods, yellow light foods, and red light foods. And the entire premise here is not about things being good or bad or right or wrong or anything like that. It's a methodology which teaches you how to maximize your insulin sensitivity. That is what this approach is going to do. And you get to decide which amount you want to follow. How much do you want to stick to this? It's up to you and your goals. We like to say we're not the food police. We're just going to help put together a system that helps you understand the consequences of your decisions. And you get to decide where to go with that. So green light foods. First category is fruits. That's all the fruits you see behind me. You see watermelon, you see papaya, you see mangoes. Um, there's uh, bananas back here. I think I have some bell peppers, some tomatoes. Bell peppers and tomatoes are actually fruits, technically, botanically. So we have fruits in the number one category. These are low fat and they're super water rich, very healthy foods. Then we go into starchy vegetables. That's gonna be potatoes, yams, butternut squash. Then this third category is beans, peas, lentils. Fourth category is intact whole grains. Intact being the key word. They are not processed. Quinoa, you have oat groats, you have farro, you have millet. Those are intact whole grains. Then we have leafy greens, non-starchy vegetables, herbs and spices, and mushrooms. That's the green light category. These foods, you literally are advised to eat as much as you want when you're hungry until you're satisfied. Don't limit those foods. And I know a lot of people think, trying to lose weight or trying to lower their blood glucose levels are like, wait a minute, you gotta be kidding me. You're telling me I can eat all the potatoes I want? You're telling me I can eat all the chickpeas I want? You're telling me I can eat all the bananas I want? Like, are you sure? <laughs> the answer is yes. And all the details are in this book to get into the mad science of insulin resistance and why those foods actually are gonna help you reverse it. But the key is these foods are low in fat, they're loaded with their water content, and they're whole foods, they're not processed. That fiber is key in the blood glucose control process, the ability to be satisfied from meal to meal, to not overeat, fiber, water content, huge. Okay, yellow light category. These are foods that are either a little bit more processed or they're just a little bit higher in their fat content and we gotta be cognizant of how much you're consuming. We're not saying that like, you know, the yellow light just means limit just means eat a smaller amount so that's nuts and seeds that's avocado that's coconut meat that's going to be olives that's going to be soy products so edamame is the most whole intact form of soy that's what we recommend the second best thing is going to be tempeh and then tofu 
Tofu is a little more processed than tempeh. But all of them are high in fat. The 40% of the calories coming from fat. And you got to be careful when you're having food that, that already, that's already that high in fat. Then we put in things like bread. So even Ezekiel bread, a great food, great product, great option. Sprouted breads like that. They're good. They're just higher in their calorie density. And they're more processed, which means they're going to elevate your blood glucose quicker. And they're going to inhibit your weight loss. Okay? So it's better to have millet than millet bread. That's the ideal option. That's why millet's in the green light category, millet bread's in the yellow light category. Um, we also have things like fermented foods in the yellow light category. Again, healthy, beneficial, great for gut um, health. But too much of it can be a little bit of a problem. Okay, now the red light category, these are foods that are known to cause to insulin resistance. All right? That is going to be, we're going to put animal products in there. So red meat white meat, fish, seafood, those foods we are recommending you avoid to maximize your insulin sensitivity. And then we're also going to have the obvious, which is processed foods. So Twinkies, okay? They belong in the red light category, all right? Um, the obvious things where it's just processed, you know, really garbage food. And then we're also going to have a little more, you know, things that people might be a little more confused about of, you know, the modern vegan foods. So you know, a Beyond Meat burger or something like that. It's great for the environment. It's a great transition food, but it's not going to lead to insulin sensitivity. Okay. It's processed, it's high in fat. So we got to limit those foods. And then we also put oil in this category. And the primary reason we have oil in the red light category is because of the calorie density. This is going to inhibit weight loss. It's going to, and weight loss is a huge component for a lot of people in maximizing their insulin sensitivity. A lot of people, they, they, they struggle to eat a small amount of oil, so it's better to just take it out. Eat, eat olives. You don't need olive oil. You can, it's very easy to learn how to cook without oil. We write about it in our book. You don't need it for the flavor. Um, eat coconut meat in a small, in, a, in an appropriate portion. You don't need coconut oil. It, it's a refined food. You've removed all the water content. You've removed the protein. You've removed the fiber, you, fiber. You've removed a vast amount of vitamins and minerals. It's just pure fat. So that's why we put oil in the red light category. And when you follow this system, it's very simple. It's very clear. You just follow the recipes in the book. You'll be eating green light foods. You'll be eating an appropriate amount of the yellow light foods. And the food tastes amazing, and the results are even better. So what are the myths of a plant-based diet? Okay, so, I mean myths. I tell you what, I mean, one thing is that it doesn't taste good. That's one thing. People think, oh, I'm just going to eat, you know, a bunch of rabbit food. I'm just going to eat a bunch of uh, carrots and lettuce all day long. And that is a huge, huge myth about plant-based nutrition. The meals are delicious. They are delicious. They're abundant. They're vibrant. They're exciting. You get to, you look forward to it. Your taste buds come alive. Um, and when people start adopting a plant-based lifestyle, they get to eat a lot of new foods, like new ingredients. People have never had a watermelon radish. A lot of people have never heard of okra. People have never heard of chayote, which is, a, and these are ingredients that are at every grocery store. They're just in a, you know, a section that maybe you haven't looked at. You've just been walking by them in the produce aisle. Many people, I mean, they've never had a Kent mango. They don't know the difference between a Kent mango and a Keat mango. And they taste different and they both taste extraordinary. And, you know, and a honey mango or like, so it's not boring. Um, people don't, you know, really haven't had maybe good quinoa or have red lentils versus green lentils. Like there's a lot of fun things to do here when it comes to the ingredients themselves and the dishes you make, whether it's like a lasagna or if it's, you know, um, a, a Buddha bowl of some sort, like it's fun. So that's a that's a huge myth. I think a lot of people um, they're concerned that a plant based diet is not adequate as it comes to protein. I mean that's not that's not the case. And uh, as coaches, again, what we do at Mastering Diabetes is we are super passionate about coaching. I mean, I, I left Forks Over Knives, Cyrus left NASA and some some biotech work. To, for us to join forces and create something that didn't exist. If you were living with some form of diabetes, if you're living with insulin resistance and you 
wanted to address that. There wasn't one coaching program to go to. There wasn't one destination. We were doing all kinds of great work at Forks Over Knives, publishing testimonials, publishing great recipes. But if you wanted a coach, somebody to really walk you through the process, that didn't exist. So we created Mastering Diabetes. And when we're working with clients and they come to us with protein concerns, we like to just show them straight up with Chronometer, with nutrition logging software, which is something we talk about in our book as well. And it's not difficult to use and you don't have to use it forever. But when you do use it and you see the data, you see the numbers, oh, wow. All I did was just eat a bunch of these master diabetes recipes, ate a variety of foods that I enjoyed. I didn't overthink it. But at the end of the day, I exceeded all my amino acid requirements by just eating this variety of whole plant foods. And that's a huge myth. So the protein is abundant in these whole foods. You don't need to overthink it. You don't need to chase amino acids. You don't need to chase nutrients. When you eat this varied diet, you are in good shape. Well, on this show, we like to celebrate Guide Connect, which provide hope. And we're celebrating your book, uh, Mastering Diabetes, and the work you're doing. It's a beautiful book, by the way. I've seen it. Thank you. Um, and you've given us some good guidance. I, I want to stay in the guidance category for just a second. So, uh, you know, I'm in the Midwest. Okay. We're, you know, meat and potatoes kind of uh, people here. So sure. how can people start to shift? They say, you know what, I'm not ready to go to be a, a vegan or plant-based, but what can they do to start to maybe shift to that direction? What would be your recommendation? My recommendation would be to start with breakfast. Just set your sights on changing one meal a day and breakfast is one of the easiest meals to change, and it's one of the least um, you know, intensive when it comes to prep work, and we are very fruit-friendly at Mastering Diabetes. So if you can start your day eating three to four servings of your favorite fruit, or you start adding in a fruit smoothie, this can have a big impact on your energy, on your quality of life, and I, I just, I, I can't recommend it enough. Get started. I was just in, I grew up in Minnesota. I just came back from a trip to Minnesota. I was in uh, Niswa, uh, the Brainerd area. I grew up in St. Cloud. My family is in Minneapolis. And um, I'll tell you, you guys have great food there. It's great produce right now in the summertime. Uh, I got some amazing local tomatoes. The grocery stores have everything you need. These ingredients are available. Um, year round, we live in a world where we can get great produce year round. So starting with breakfast, and I would also encourage you to expand your palate when it comes to breakfast. Like try some new mangoes, try some papaya. This is, this is a, I got a Meridol papaya right here. Okay. This is called the Meridol papaya. All right. So like try new foods, um, tr really enjoy it, open up your mind. And then as the results come in, maybe add another meal. Maybe add a third meal. Take it one step at a time. Don't overwhelm yourself. Don't think this is black and white and about perfectionism. And I, if, I don't, if I'm eating anything in the red light category, I'm bad or something like that. No, 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 no. More plants. More plants in your diet. And that's all you got to do. So think about instead of what you're getting rid of, add more of the good stuff in. The bad stuff will start to fluff away. That's right. So, that's so, so as we start to wrap up the show, how, what's the best way for people to find you? Okay, so the best way to find us is to go to masteringdiabetes.org and right there on the homepage, you'll see an option to take a quiz. And you can take the insulin resistance quiz and find out how insulin resistant are you. It's gonna ask you simple questions, takes a few minutes to fill out, and that's the best way to get connected. So start there. Um, if you like listening to podcasts, we have a Mastering Diabetes podcast. So type in Mastering Diabetes into any podcast platform and you will find us, Apple, Spotify, SoundCloud, we're everywhere. Um, if you enjoy Instagram and you like watching Instagram stories and you want recipes that we've published on Instagram and you like watching Instagram lives, uh, check us out there, at Mastering Diabetes. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube. But uh, most importantly, pick up the book. The book is available where books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your local bookstore. They'll have the hardcover version. The Kindle version is available on Amazon. It's available on Nook for Barnes & Noble. We also read our own audiobook. So you can find that on Audible. You can find that on the Google Play Store, wherever you listen to audiobooks. 
Cyrus and I had a fun time reading that. We also added in some extra information in the beginning of each chapter. We also added in a little bit of new science that didn't make it into the book, but since we read the audiobook like last minute, we could add some stuff. So um, check that out if you enjoy audiobooks and uh, we hope to connect with you. Like we, we just love helping Dr. Robin. We just love helping people. If people DM us on Instagram, we will reply to their message. If they write to us on our Facebook page, we will reply. We have a free Facebook group. You can just type in Mastering Diabetes in the Facebook. There's a community there. So we like to meet people where they are and help and give information to answer questions and get people to achieve their health goals that they're looking to achieve. Well, there's not a, a, a doubt of surprise in my mind that you're passionate about this message and that you probably got type 1 diabetes, so it pulled you closer to your calling. So as we wrap up the show, I've got two last questions for you. Uh, Robbie, what do you think your medicine is for the world? Okay. My medicine for the world is plants. Like plants are the medicine um, and, and just go for it and enjoy it. So eat more plants. So um, I always like to end the show. And first of all, I'll say thank you for joining me. I loved your passion. I love your background with all the plants and vegetables and um, encouraging people to get more of a plant-based diet. Like he's like uh, Robbie said, just, just take the next step. Um, maybe take it one meal at a time, start with breakfast. But I'd like to end the show with a quote. I'm a little bit of a word nerd. What's a quote? What's one of your favorite quotes? Okay, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, I have a few. Um, how you do anything is how you do everything. But honestly, there's also one I've literally typed in my phone from a book I'm reading, and I'm going to share it right now to make sure I get it right. Well, what's the and, book you read? Well, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting one. Um, it's called Signs, and it's about how sometimes when, when people pass that we can still connect with them. And it's very interesting. And she said, those who don't believe in magic will never find it. You got to believe first. Okay, let's start there. Like, you want to believe in reversing type 2 diabetes. You want to believe in getting your best A1C. You want to believe in improving your time and range if you're living with type 1 diabetes. Like, you want to believe, like, I, I can have energy again. Start there, and then it's going to happen. Uh, I love it. Small changes, big shifts. Well, it's funny. I picked a quote based on uh, diabetes, and it it's interesting. I think it kind of goes with our talk, but maybe not. But I researched possibly thinking what might be a, a great quote. And so once again, I want to thank you for joining me today. Thank those people listening to the show. And thanks for, uh, I know several of you reach out to me, and I'm grateful for your uh, connection. So here's my quote. It's by Karen Samuelson. And it's sugar is this sociopath of foods. It acts like sweet, but it's really poison. Mm. I'm guessing sugar, processed sugar is on your red list. That's exactly right. Processed sugar. We write about it all in the book, how people get confused with the difference between processed sugar and the quote unquote sugars found in whole foods, which are different. They're not sugars. They're glucose and fructose and sucrose. Totally different ballgame. So we're talking processed sugar. Yep. Like you eat cake and mm -hmm. cookies and ice cream. Some of you that are having that, you might want to grab an apple instead with maybe a little bit of nut butter. Would that be an okay snack instead of? Um, you can do that. Be a little bit careful with how much nut butter you're using. But yes, that's a great snack. Maybe a step in the right direction. Sugar, yes. sugar is the so. I thought that was so funny. Sociopath of foods. And that's funny. That is funny. Really yeah. poison. All yeah. right. Thanks for joining me on Small Changes, Big Shifts. Go out and have a great week, everybody. I'll chat with you soon. Thanks for having me. I sure appreciate you listening to Small Changes Big Shifts. If you go to the website, smallchangesbigshifts.com, we'll have the show notes ready for you there. If this episode inspired you to make a small change that will lead to a big shift, please share with a friend. You can catch our episode on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, and our website. And if you feel like it, please leave a rating or a comment. Be sure to subscribe so you can catch our episode next week. Blessings to you.